I'm Wazza and welcome to Bike File, the bike show that brings you the very best new bikes on the market. And I'm Paul Johnston and each week we look at a different category of bike. This particular show is dedicated to monster trailies. Now the big issue here is pose or practicality. Some folk will argue that these bikes are piles of tap because they're next to useless off-road. But others will say they are the greatest thing since the wheel because not only do they make good road blasters, but they stand out from the crowd as well. Well, we'll be judging each bike in terms of value, style, practicality and performance and at the end of the show the one with the most points is quite simply the winner. So let's have a look at this week's contenders. We've got BMW's newest offering, the R1200 GS. Next up we have Italy's offering, the Aprilia Capo Nord. Flying the flag for good old Blighty, it's Triumph's Tiger. Then there's the stonking Suzuki V-Strom. And finally, back to Italy with Ducati's Multistrada. So those are the bikes that we have to play with this week. On then to our first test, which is going to be, was it? It's going to be the brand new BMW R1200 GS, which you've ridden and raved about. Everyone else I know has ridden and raved about, so I'm going to go out and see what I think. Well, you shouldn't let other people's judgment cloud your own, you know. True, Just go true. out, make up your own mind, but I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Well, I'll be ready to hate it. <laughs> BMW launched the first of their GS models almost a quarter of a century ago. But for 2004, the GS has now grown to have 1,200 cc's, it's been totally updated, and has undergone some significant weight loss and a very healthy power gain. Just as Triumph excel themselves with their Tiger, so BMW show us what they're really capable of when they put their organised German brains to one side and cut loose to give us the GS. Now those previous GS models just like bumblebees that, according to the laws of physics as we understand them, shouldn't be able to fly, so those bikes shouldn't have been able to be ridden the way they could. They were just too big. But you could go bananas on that last GS, and pretty much everyone before it. Despite a meagre 85 horsepower and a stonking 227 kilos to cart about, the old R1150 was a blinder. Now we lose 28 kilos and gain 15 brake horsepower in the slim fast achievement of the century. Looks are still, hmm, distinctive if I'm being polite, and plain old bug ugly if I'm not, but this is now a real tool. Physically, this bike does feel smaller than its predecessors, so it's going to be a lot more manageable to a lot more people. But with those great big bars up front, it's still very, very chuckable. It's also the only bike here with genuine off-road abilities. Stick a Dirtmeister on one of these and they'll happily blast across the nearest desert, lake or mountain without batting an eyelid. The likes of you and I, however, should not be fooled into taking the shortcut home across the nearest hillside, however. Because no matter how good these can be when operated by superhuman Parry Dakar types, they'll still pin mortals like the rest of us into the floor at the first sign of anything much rougher than a gravel driveway. Better instead to stick to the roads where you'll find that this is an almost infinitely capable motorcycle. With stacks of flat twin shove to waft you along, this will happily tackle your daily commute, take your touring and even battle the twisties right into the bargain. So what about the scores? Styling, 6 out of 10. Good bike, but it still looks like Lego gone wrong. Performance, 9 out of 10. Quite stunning for what it is. Practicality, 9 out of 10 again. This bike does it all, and if you've got the cash for BMW's very expensive extras, it'll do even more. Value, 7 out of 10. It is the most expensive bike here, and no way is it cheap, but boy is it worth it. I just knew you'd be impressed with this, was it? I didn't want to be. <laughs> I don't want it to win, but oh, it is good, isn't it? It is very, very good, isn't it? It's good at, in all departments, really. It's expensive though, isn't it? It is, it is. Maybe one of these can come in, underprice it, which mm. they all do, but outperform it. That is the biggest problem with this. Uh, it, you get a lot for your money, but it is a lot of money. Well, yeah. let's go from Big this outlay. very expensive to the cheapest of our bunch today, Aprilia's Capo Nord. What do you know about these? Well, 
The engine's a belter, mm. good old 60 degree V twin, but I've always found it a bit squadgy, a bit heavy, a bit, doesn't leave much of an impression. Well, we'll see, we've got 31 points to beat, haven't we? Yeah, That's let's cool. hope it can leave an impression <laughs> on you. For your sake, let's hope it beats the VM, mate. Eh? Let's have a go. <laughs> The Italian company has taken its Austrian-built engine, tuned it for more mid-range and less top-end, and produced a trailer to take on Honda's Africa Twin and Suzuki's V-Strom. They do say, don't they, if you're going to have one, well, you might as well have a big one, and giant trailers or monster trailers these days don't come very much bigger than this, Aprilia's Capo Nord or the ETV 1000. It's big, it's very bulky, it's quite heavy as well. It's got a 1000cc V-twin motor, so it's going to be an absolute pig to ride, right? Uh, wrong. It's actually one of the most manageable giant trailers on the market today. The 60-degree V-twin has been taken from Aprilia's Mille and softened slightly to provide just the right amount of performance for this machine. It will still reach an impressive top speed of over 130 miles an hour, but more importantly, there's bucket loads of mid-range power, which is ideal for hours of relaxed long-distance touring. Not that many years ago, it would have been somewhat unusual to see this style of aluminium frame on this style of bike, but there is now a massive amount of technology goes into the design of these machines. The idea, you see, has been to keep as much of the weight as possible directly over the centre of gravity, so although this is physically a big bike and at 215 kilos it's no lightweight, it actually feels very well balanced. It's not too top heavy and believe it or not, it's very easy to ride. It's also very, very comfortable and surprisingly smooth for a V-twin with very little vibration finding its way through to the bars and foot pegs. There's a reasonable amount of protection from the screen and as a long distance tourer it's definitely worth some consideration. As for any off-road ability, I'd say forget it, unless you're prepared to work very hard. Loose gravel and dusty lanes may be okay, but it would be such a shame to get all of that nice Italian plastic covered in mud. Once again, we're down to style, which I know is a very subjective issue, but for me, it's not the prettiest bike I've ever seen. It's too angular in its bodywork, and I don't like the dashboard. It's too Star Trek-y style. It looks too fussy and too complicated. Also, there's no main stand on this bike, which I, again, personally think is a problem. But it is the cheapest bike here today, so it could score well. So, on to the scoring. Style is 6 out of 10. It's very pointy, but not necessarily in all the right places. Performance, 8 out of 10. Very strong engine with lots of usable power. Practicality, 8. A good level of rider comfort and ideal for long distances. Value, 8 out of 10. It's the cheapest of our bikes here today. Oh, that was close. Just one point shy of that pisky BMW. Uh, yeah, it's a great bike, this. There's nothing wrong with it, really. It's just, as we said, and as you said before I rode it, it's a bit big and lumpy, isn't it? A bit clunky. Yeah, style lets it down a bit. Mm. But um, it's the cheapest bike here, and in this class, it's, it's very good value. Absolute bargain. Yeah. And Italian, but how's about we go British now? Right. Next up is the Tiger. I've not been a fan of these tri triple engines. I know you don't mind them, but you know I'm not keen. I think in this it could be good, but the best thing is British and the orange matches me flowers perfectly. <laughs> well, if you want to ride along the road with a flowered helmet looking like a right punce, <laughs> it's up to you, mate. I'm happy. <laughs> Tigers have been great bikes for Triumph long before this current model. It's been around since 1992 and shares the engine from Triumph's flagship sports bike, the Daytona 955i. The engine's been retuned for more mid-range and kicking out 104 brake horsepower, this bike feels lively with its distinctive triple heart beating away beneath it. I'm going to come clean here and admit that Triumphs haven't always been my bag. Being a bit of a sports bike nut, I've often found their sports bikes a little too cumbersome and ponderous to really hit the mark, with the one main exception being that new Daytona. But there are other things Triumph are incredibly good at. 
One is trading on nostalgia by churning out truckloads of Bonneville-style replicas that offer a lovely classic hit without all the oil leaks and roadside tantrums. And the other is this, the Tiger. Even those early Tigers were blinding, if a little heavy, and managed to make the most of the Hinkley factory's raw triple motor. As for this latest incarnation, it's even more of the same. Where this motor can feel a little bit out of its depth trying to be a sports bike in something like the 955, here it makes perfect sense, delivering a lovely gutsy stomp right the way through the rev range. And the chassis is a belter too. Should you feel really daft, then knee down on one of these is actually possible, as I discovered while getting carried away on the launch. And should you not feel so silly, then what you'll find is a surprisingly potent package that obliterates back roads with ease. Same story goes on with the brakes. They're sharp and strong without being too much of either. And all in all, this bike is looking like a top contender for taking the honours here today. It's not only slightly less ponderous than some of the competition, but it's also better looking as well. Much like most of the rest of the competition, however, it's also about as much use off-road as a chocolate teapot. Now it's over to the scoreboard. Styling, eight out of 10. Bright orange and looks the business. Performance, seven out of 10. There's definitely more in there than you'd expect. Practicality, eight out of 10. Especially with those panniers and heated grips, this is a versatile motorcycle. Value, seven out of 10. It's not the cheapest bike here, but I'd say it's well worth the money. Another good score then was, another successful mission. Definitely good. Love that engine. I know it doesn't quite do it for you, no, but I, I just really it, enjoyed it. It sounds like it's ready to explode to me, the engine. It's oh, a bit too rattly. Can be in the sports parts, but in here, made sense. Panniers are now thrown in as part yeah, of the deal. Standard them, yeah. As are the heated grips. Yeah. You can't knock it at all, and you can fly the flag. I just <laughs> wish I could have found a way of giving it two more points to get rid of that BMW. I couldn't do it. Well, the BMW is still in the lead. Will it still be there at the end of the show? Well, you can find out in part two when we'll be riding Suzuki's V-Strom and Ducati's Multistrada. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Bike File, where this week we're looking at big trailies. So far we've had the BMW, the Aprilia and the Triumph, and the BMW's in the lead. So it's going to be now down to the Suzuki and the Ducati to take it on. Which one are you going for first, Paul? We're going for this one, Suzuki's DL1000, the V-Strom. Ah, yes. Motorcycling's biggest spelling mistake. Uh, no, it's not, actually, you huh? see. No, it's not, it's not, because Strom, sure? Strom is a German word. You're thinking it should say Storm, don't it, you? Of course it should. No, no, no. It's Strom is a German word, which means power. So it's oh. V-Strom, V-Power. I didn't v know that. See, I told you this would be an education for you. <laughs> yeah, working with you, you've certainly taught me a lesson. The V-Strom is Suzuki's answer to the new breed of big V-twin trailers. It's long, softly suspended and softly styled with good solid engineering and day-to-day -day practicality. This bike seems to have a slightly familiar feel to it, possibly because that 90 degree V-twin engine there is really based on the old TL1000 lump, and indeed it is the same unit that now sits in Suzuki's SV1000, although here it's been retuned to give a broader spread of mid-range torque at the expense of top-end power. That said, it still feels quite lively, it's quite a responsive bike, and that broad spread of mid-range is just the job on a machine like this. The seat is 840 millimetres above the ground and sadly it's non-adjustable so if you struggle with some of today's modern sports bikes then you'll have no chance with this. Another problem, and some will agree it's a big one, is that you don't get a centre stand fitted as standard, although you can buy one as an optional extra. That simply isn't good enough on a bike that claims to be good at touring. You don't want the bike leaning over as you empty your panniers after a 500 mile trek across Europe. But let's get positive again and talk about the handling, which is fine. And that's it, it's fine. It's not fantastic, but it's okay. It does a job, this bike. The steering's all right, it's quite positive, fairly precise, goes where you point it and all that stuff. The suspension, though, is quite softly sprung, so it does 
fairly good job of floating you across most of the bumps and the potholes on the roads that we're on every day. But this essentially is a road bike. Okay, it's not opposed to the odd little off-road adventure, maybe along a dusty track or something, but really nothing more than that. It weighs 207 kilos, so it's lighter than some of the bikes in this class, so maybe it could just about go where some of the others might not dare to try. To sum up then, this is a fine motorcycle to ride, but it's not perfect. Apart from the aforementioned seats and centre stand, the screen for me personally was too low to give any decent wind protection. Perhaps an adjustable one like that on the 650 version would be the answer. So finally, we're back down to the looks and the style of the bike, which personally I think is okay. It's not drop dead gorgeous, I know that, but it's what we kind of expect a giant trailer to look like these days. Unfortunately though for Suzuki, this is by no means the cheapest bike in this class, and that could be its biggest problem. So over to the scores. For style, it's seven out of 10. It's not beautiful, but it's no dog. Performance, seven out of 10. The motor can feel a little lumpy at times. Practicality, seven out of 10. Needs an adjustable screen to cover any great distances. Value, it's six out of 10. Quite simply, too expensive in this company. Well, that's a fairly average score there, isn't it, Paul? It is an average score, and that's the right word to use, because it's an average bike. It's not terrible, but it's not brilliant at anything. It's... It just doesn't quite grab you, does it? No, it, it, the engine's all right, it's fairly lively. It's very comfortable, I could sit on it all day, but it's just not boring. It's just average. average. It does the job and, and no more. Its biggest problem, and we both know this is true, yeah. in this particular class, it's simply too expensive. It is, isn't it? I mean, if you were spending that sort of money, going to the bank, taking the load out, you could get yourself something nice and exclusive, like a Ducati, a perhaps. Of Italian Exotica, yeah, yeah. What do you reckon? Well, I have to say, from where I'm stood here at the front, I hate it. But from where you're stood at the back, I quite like it. I know what you mean. It is a little bit body off Baywatch, face off Crime Watch, isn't it? You know what, you've hit the nail right on the head. The Ducati Multistrada. It's a bit of an oddball name, but Multistrada in Italian means many roads. The Italian company has spent years developing this bike to be the right mix of sports bike handling with enduro style comfort. A real world motorcycle for real world riders, as Ducati would tell you. Now, hang on a minute. If this is a big trailies test, then what on earth is this bike doing here? Surely this is about as close to being a big trailie as I am to being a rocket scientist. But then, if it isn't an off-roader, what is it? Pretty much unquantifiable, that's what. But with its longish travel suspension, high perch and wide bars, it's closer to the rest of the bikes in this class than it is to just about anything else. So for the time being, this is where it will be. So let's forget the labels for a minute and concentrate on the metal. Because if you do that, you'll find a wonderfully refreshing and surprising motorcycle lurking in this here Multistrada. Because the brakes, the chassis and the motor are all so nicely balanced together that this combines to become one of the best plain fun bikes out on the road today. There's 992 cc's of air-cooled, fuel-injected Ducati loveliness lurking in that motor, and it pumps out a marvellous spread of creamy, thumpy drive. Never too much to frighten, but always enough to slap a smile on your mush when needed. Ducati's trademark trellis frame also finds its way onto the Multistrada and makes for excellent handling and precision, which leaves most of the other bikes here wallowing in its wake. It's not perfect, mind. There's this seat, which won't do you any favours the wrong side of 50 miles, and pillions get even more of a raw deal and get their backsides baked into the bargain. Also, servicing and running costs are going to be a little bit up on the competition. But this aside, this is still one of the best plain fun bikes around today. So how does the Ducati stack up on the scoreboard? Styling's going to be a 7 out of 10. Some bits are great, some bits, mm, not so great. Performance, nine out of 10. Get it on the right road and you're gonna have a ball on one of these. Practicality, 
6 out of 10. Sadly, it's not very comfortable and it needs looking after. Value, 6 out of 10. If it's what you're looking for, you'll be happy to pay the money. Otherwise, you may be making a mistake. I think you quite liked it, didn't you? Really, really enjoyed it. I mean, it may be uncomfortable, it may be a bit unwieldy at low speed, but point these down a twisty back road and you just can't fail to enjoy yourself. It's a really fun, pleasant riding experience. Mm. I think the sort of bike that if you had plenty of money to spare, you'd probably have one in your garage just as part of a collection, just to check out, to, to look a bit different. Would be beautiful. It, an alternative yeah. to a sports bike for someone who wants a bit of fun, but not too much. Exactly. But it's not this week's winner. Sadly well, we've nice. ridden all five bikes now. Let's have a quick recap on the old scores. First out of the blocks, it was BMW's R1200 GS, which racked up an impressive 31 points. Then it was the Italian Aprilia Capo Nord, scoring 30 points. Then came Triumph's Tiger, also on 30 points. Then we had the Suzuki V-Strom, with 27 points. Finally, edging ahead of the Suzuki, it was Ducati's Multistrada, with 28. Which means the BMW R1200 GS has won our five bike test this week. Well, the BMW is our clear winner for this week, but there are just two things wrong with that result, Paul. And uh, what are those, was there? Well, the first would be that it would seem you and I are in complete agreement for the first time ever. That's true, yes, yeah. <laughs> and as well as that, the German bike has won. <laughs> I know, you wanted to hate this bike, I know that. But, I mean, I've got to say, and we both agree with this, mm. it's the best bike here. I know it's the most expensive. Yeah but you genuinely do get what you pay for. It's a class motorcycle. Every time I tried to find a fault, it came back with an answer. You just could do just about anything on that motorcycle. Well, it's great. We both love it. At least we're in total agreement for once. That's it for this week's Bike File. Join us next week when we'll have five more bikes. It's a cracker, isn't it?